Now, there's one very simple reason why relationships can be analyzed with a good deal of rigor. And it has to do with the fact that underlying all relationships, there are patterns of interactions that can be mapped and understood. And it's those patterns of interactions that define the character of a relationship. And so let me introduce to you two patterns, highly familiar patterns, that I've been able to undercover, uncover in all this work I've been doing. And the first one is an authority relationship. And on one side of an authority relationship, you got the boss. And on the other side, you have the subordinates. Okay? That's the relationship. So let's start with the boss. This is what you often find. I'm looking for a yes man who can say no without sounding negative. Okay? Recognize that? Okay? And then this is the common reaction on the part of people who report to that person. You ask a question, all those in favor say aye, 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 and everybody's thinking, say it ain't so, oh no, perish the thought, a thousand times no. Okay? So they're having reactions that they're not saying. Recognize this dynamic? How many recognize it? A lot of people recognize it. Okay, so now let's think about a second pattern, which is the cross-functional pattern. And then on one side, you have the two people heading up the units. It's not enough that we succeed, but cats must also fail. <laughs> and, and I know, as an athlete, that competition is a great thing. It can bring out the best in us. But competition that's contingent on my winning is at your expense can sometimes create problems. In fact, the problem it creates is that then you have to get together and you have to solve one of those complex problems with people who have different points of view and it doesn't get done and things aren't going as well and you're trying to figure out why and you're sitting at the meeting and people say, and now at this point in the meeting, I'd like to shift the blame off of me and on to someone else. Okay? So the reason why we laugh is because we recognize these patterns. But what we lack are the tools to understand three things, which is how relationships work, how they develop over time, and what you can do to change them. Okay, so it's how do they work, how do they develop over time, and how can you change them. And that's what I'd like us to think a little bit about now by introducing a framework that I've spent time developing that would allow us to do all three of those things. So it's not three different frameworks, it's one framework. It allows you to do all three. Three things for the price of one. And I call it the anatomy of a relationship because it gets at the underlying character or structure of a relationship. And I'd like to begin by telling you a story about an organization that I worked with recently. It's a nonprofit. It's in Toronto. It's international. And they do unbelievably great things. And they're growing like gangbusters. And one of the problems they're facing is how to keep up with the pace of growth. And so the founder of the organization, who's extremely charismatic, said to me when I first met him, he said, look, I got a problem. He said, if I got hit by a bus, I don't know what we'd do. There's no successor in this group. There aren't people taking initiative. There aren't people stepping up and telling me their point of view. You know, these people are just not successor material. And I went, well, God, that's a problem. So I trundled off and I talked to the team and I said, so, you know, tell me a little bit about the team. And they said, our biggest problem is founder syndrome. He won't let go. When he has a point of view, he's got a point of view and there's nothing you can do to ever change that point of view. You know, and it's really tough. So I said, okay, well, let me go and observe you. That's what I do. I go and observe meetings, bring my tape recorder, and try to watch what happens. So I go to the first meeting, and here's what I notice. A acts. That's the leader. We'll call him Abe, not to be confused with Abraham Lincoln. Abe says, you know what? I had an idea about a way we can deal with a problem we're having over in Europe. I have an idea, and I'd like to, I'd like to run it by you and, and get your thoughts. And so the team reacts by thinking, uh-oh, here comes another one of those ideas he'd like our reactions to. Um, better trod gently. And so they then act by saying, um, gee, do you really think that's a good idea? 
And so he reacts by saying, yeah, I, I, I kind of did think it was a good idea. And he's thinking to himself, why don't, if they don't think it's a good idea, why don't they say so? This is just not leadership material. This is incredibly risk averse. They can't even tell me what they're thinking. To. Is it because they have no point of view? And so the way he responds, the way he acts, is to say, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Let me tell you the three reasons why I think it's a good idea. And then they hear this. And they say, oh, my God, look how strong he's advocating the idea. This is clearly a done deal. And so the next thing they say is, okay, it's your call. And the next thing he feels is utter despair. He goes, oh, my God, can't they ever tell me what they're thinking? It's my call. He says, I, we're trying to build a team here. So this goes on. This pat that's how patterns begin. That's stage one. That's stage one, Okay. And after a while, people, when they're in these patterns, they can't help but ask themselves the question, why is this happening? Why is this happening? 